Well, let's look next at how you can make your smoke collide with things. And there are two methods now in Houdini 12 for colliding your object uh, with smoke. And first of all, I'm going to demonstrate the old fashioned method. So I've just got basic smoke simulation here that we've been using with the smoke emitted from a sphere. And I've got this box here that I want to use to collide with the smoke. So let me just, in fact, turn this box into a rigid body object. Using the traditional method of collisions, everything that you want the smoke to collide with has to be either a rigid body object or a static object. In this case, it's a bit more interesting if I make this a rigid body object. So with the object selected, I'm going to click a rigid body object cool tool, and that's now a rigid body object. So we'll see it just falls down like that. Not very useful. So let us also, uh, again with this still selected, use an RBD pin constraint. There we are. So with the box selected, select that. I'm invited to select the object, which is the box. So I can just press enter. And then I can select a position for our constraint. Let's just try that. So the effect of this is to have our box swing down across our smoke as so. Let me just move this a little bit further up so that it There we go. So what we want to have is this box interacting with our smoke. Now at the moment the smoke is all falling downwards because we have a gravity node here and that's acting on the smoke and as we saw earlier the buoyancy lift arising from the fact that our smoke is hot is has only got a value of 5 whereas the gravity has a value of 9. So what I'm going to do what I want to do is just apply this gravity only to the box. I'm going to hit L to lay out these nodes. So on the left hand side here we've got the Dynamex nodes that are manipulating our box, causing it to swing, uh, along with the RBD pin constraint down here. And then on the right hand side we have everything to do with the smoke. So if I move my... Let's disconnect this and disconnect this. If I move my gravity node and put it here, Let's reconnect this here. Uh, the effect of this will be that only the rigid body object is going to get affected by the gravity and the smoke is not going to get affected by the gravity. So let me downsize that. What we should now see is that our smoke will rise upwards because of that. And then our box cuts through our smoke and we can see the velocity of the box is being inherited and forcing the smoke off towards the right hand side of the screen there. So this is the traditional method for making your objects interact with smoke. Next I'm going to demonstrate the new method of making objects interact with smoke. So now uh, I've got pretty much the same setup. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to switch uh, the dynamic simulation off by clicking this, this brain-shaped button down here. Uh, I've put some animation here at the seed level onto our box. So this is our box. And if we play through, we can see that the box moves across the screen and then back again. And I've just keyframed that animation. And we want this box to interact with our smoke. Well, the new tool, tool available in Houdini 12 is here on the Populate Container shelf, and it's Collide with Objects. So in order for this to work, let me click the tool, and it's asking for the objects that I want to collide with. So it's this box, press Enter, and then the Fluid. So select the Fluid box and press Enter. So let's have a now a look at our box and we can see that we've got the familiar 
fluid source node now inserted here into our box object. And if we have a look at our auto.network, let me enlarge this, hit L to lay it out. We can see that we've got this uh, new node here, source collision from box object. And this is the same source volume node that we're familiar with from the earlier part of these videos. Uh, but in this case, it's set to a collision type. So this node is, is actually forming part of the solver. And it's this that's calculating the collision between the smoke and the object. And we can see it's fed in here at a different point in the solver. And we'll talk in a moment when we get on to talking in more detail about the smoke solver uh, the, the meaning of these various different inputs. So we can see uh, that it causes no change to the temperature by default. We could, if we wanted, add to the temperature of our smoke, have a very hot box colliding with it. But what it does do is add to the velocity. So this gives us more flexibility in handling our collisions. So let me re-enable simulation. And I'm going to pause the video and just simulate the first 100 frames of this or so, so that it's cached out and we can view it more quickly. So I've now simulated out the first 100 frames of that or so. And we can see that our box moves in, collides with the smoke, and moves off, and then comes back again. And the difference immediately between this version of the collision and the one we had previously is that the smoke here is not inheriting the velocity of the box. And we can see that because if we go down here, we can see that it's, it's not really being forced off towards the right here at all. And that's because here on our box object, if we have a look at our fluid source uh, and the velocity tab here, of course, from the point of view of this node, as we've mentioned earlier, because it's at the geometry level, there's no animation at the geometry level, it's not picking up the object's animation. It's not picking up the object's velocity. So we can again add object motion, so I can enable this. Now in this case, the object is indeed being animated here in its own uh, geometry node. So we just need the default here, which looks at the node which is enclosing this, this network. So this is, this is correct. We can scale this. So for example, I might not want it to inherit absolutely all of the motion of the box. So let's put this down, for example, to 0.5. Uh, and then let, let me simulate this through again. Sometimes it can be uh, distracting to have the visualization available here so I'm going to actually put the display flag back on the box node so that that looks like a box and we don't get the visualization. And again, I'm going to pause and then uh, simulate this through. So I've simulated that through and we can see as we scrub through that when it hits the smoke this time, it's forcing it much further off towards the right here. And then as it comes back, the same thing happens and it's forcing it much further forward off towards the left. So that's how to inherit velocity from our box. We can of course also, let me just rewind this, we can of course also inherit some curl noise. So for example, if I wanted to liven up this simulation, I could add some curl noise. And that will mean that I'm going to just increase the size of these swirls maybe a little bit and maybe increase the scale of this and so now this is going to create a lot more swirling motion as it cuts through the smoke because it's inheriting that that curl noise that we've added so once again i'm going to simulate through and demonstrate this so let's have a look at it and we can see that it's let me just pause there we can see all these strands of smoke that are coming out of the main body as the box passes through, and that's as a result of that curl noise that we added. And we can see then as it, as it goes back, again, we get a lot of very interesting swirling motion.
arising from the curl noise. So finally, let me demonstrate how to use uh, the addition of temperature to our collision object to affect our smoke. Now this is a pretty specialist thing for you to want to do, but I'll demonstrate it nevertheless. Well, to demonstrate the inheritance of temperature, we're going to use a slightly different setup. And in this case, I've positioned our source, as you can see, at the top of our smoke container. And I'm leaving the buoyancy and the gravity at their default values. So the result will be that this smoke will move downwards. And then at the bottom here, I've created a box, which I'm going to set up as a collision object. And I want it to inherit some temperature from this box. And as a result, for the smoke uh, to rise up again. So let's first of all select our box and then select the Collide with Objects tool, select our smoke container and press Enter. And we've now got our box. And we should find, as this simulates through, that it will properly collide with the dark box and we can see it spreads out and then tips over the edge of the box. However, the box is not affecting the temperature of the smoke at all, it's, it's still moving downwards. So there are two reasons why it's not affecting the temperature. Uh, here if we have a look at the fluid source, uh, we can see that it's only creating a single scalar field called collision. And that's just a representation of this box for the purposes of calculating collisions. So we don't have a temperature field, and we're going to need that in order to add temperature. And secondly, if we have a look at our auto dot network, uh, we can see here on the source volume node that handles the collisions that at temperature by default, nothing is happening. There's no effect. So let's first of all address the issue of the temperature field. Now, you may think that all we need to do to create a temperature field is to click the plus button here and to create a field called temperature. Now, in fact, that's not going to work. And the reason that's not going to work is because we have the output SDF button enabled here. And an SDF is a different way of representing an object from a fog volume. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about here, it's worth having a look at my series of videos on volumes. But an SDF is a very useful way to represent an object if you're trying to calculate collisions with that object. But it's not the way that Houdini uses to represent a temperature field. So it's not going to work if we have a temperature field, which is an SDF. So we're going to have to create the temperature field separately. So let me lay down a fluid source node here separately and I'm going to plug my box into it and we can leave the division size as it is and I'm going to make sure that this output SDF toggle is not enabled that means that this will be outputting a plain fog volume and in fact I'm not going to have density emitted I'm going to have temperature. So we're going to create a field called temperature. I'm going to actually increase it to a scale of 5, so it's going to be nice and hot. It's going to push our smoke upwards. I don't, in fact, need to create a velocity field, so we can leave that out. And this should now work. Uh, note, by the way, that this border value is rather important. Uh, if we have a look at this the way the SDF here is calculated, we can see that the border value is minus one. So anything outside the volume representation of our box for this collision field has a value of minus one. Obviously, we don't want that uh, for our temperature field. We want everything where the box isn't to have a temperature of zero. So let's then merge these two together. And I can middle click to see what's happening. And we can see in this case, I have one volume called collision. And in this case, I have one volume called temperature. And they're merged together, and that should mean that we can import both of them. 
So back in our autodop network, uh, I need to make sure that this this was set on none, and we need to make sure it's set on add. And I also need to make sure that these two fields are filled in, so that we take the temperature field from that source object and we use it on the temperature field in our DOP simulation. Let me just put the display flag on the box so we don't get the distracting visualization. And let's just see whether that's worked. So what we should find is this falling down and then it hits our box and we can see that it gets warm and then it rises up. So that's an example of how to inherit temperature from a collision object. So moving on, I want to demonstrate another of these tools up here on the populate container shelf. And this is the pump from objects tool. So I've got a setup very similar to the one we've we've just been using uh, with our source at the top, which is going to have smoke drifting downwards. And I've got a box here. And the idea of a pump is that it adds velocity to any smoke that enters the area defined by the object. So in this case, the smoke isn't going to collide with this box. The box is defining, if you like, a volume. And once the smoke gets inside that volume, it'll have a certain density added to it, a certain velocity rather, added to it. So to set this up, I'm going to select my box, I'm going to have pump from objects, and then I'm going to select my container and press enter. And we'll be familiar with what happens, which is our box has this fluid source node. Uh, and in this case, it is creating two fields. Uh, there's a field called pump, which is defining the extent of the area in which our smoke is going to be affected. Uh, and then uh, there's a pump velocity field, which is defining the velocity that's going to be added. Now, by default, this is actually going to be empty, this pump velocity field, because we've, we've not got any velocity here. So I can, for example, add curl noise. So let me just do that. I'm just going to add noise in this case. And let me just increase the swirl size a bit and then demonstrate that. So let me, I'm going to turn off visualization of the box object because it, it interferes with seeing what's happening. So this smoke is going to fall down. It's going to hit our box. And when it hits our box, enters our box rather, it is going to have this additional swirling velocity added to it which is going to produce this movement here. So once again, this is not being caused by a collision between the box and the smoke. This is being caused by the smoke's velocity being affected by those fields that we've created here. Alternatively, let me dive back in here. I'll turn off the curl noise. Alternatively, we could just add some standard velocity. So let me give it a velocity off in the x direction, for example. Uh, and this is just adding a fixed velocity. So what we should see now is our smoke comes down, it enters the space occupied by the box, and it shoots off in a positive x direction. So this can be quite a useful way to manipulate uh, the appearance of your smoke, putting these uh, pumps around to manipulate the direction of flow of your smoke or to add some curl noise in a particular part of your simulation. Well, let's demonstrate now the sync tool, sync from object. And what a sync is, is it's an area in your simulation where smoke will be deleted. So the principle is that when smoke enters the area defined by an object, in this case it's going to be this box, the density of the box will be subtracted from the smoke so that there will be less smoke after it falls through the box than there was before it started. 
So let's to set this up, let's select our box and then select the sync from object tool and select our fluid container. And we can see that this has created the familiar set of nodes to convert our box into a volume. And in our auto.network, if we lay this out, we can see that there's an extra node at the end here, source sync from box object. And this is, if I select it, we can see that it is set up as a sync. And what it does is it's sourcing the volume doesn't do anything to temperature velocity and it's doing what's called a clamp sub so it's subtracting uh, the density of our source or our box rather from the smoke that's coming through but making sure that we don't go below zero now in fact because of the way smoke is generated here you can sometimes have density of smoke that is greater than one so it's useful here let me go down it's useful to, to perhaps up this a bit to, say, four or five. It's not going to change the... We're not going to get a negative amount of smoke by doing that. We're just going to make sure that all of the smoke is deleted as it, as it enters this box. So I'm actually going to turn off the visibility of the box because we can then see more clearly the smoke disappearing. So the smoke falls down, it enters our box, and we can see very clearly it disappears as it as it enters this box. And to complete our coverage of the shelf tools here, let's have a look at the expand from object. And we've got our familiar setup except I've got this sphere at the bottom here, this small sphere, and I'm going to select that, hit expand from object, select our fluid container and press enter. So we now have these nodes attached to this smaller sphere and this is creating a divergence volume. And a divergence volume, or divergence, is a property of fluid simulations and it's to do with whether fluid needs to move away from a particular part of the fluid simulation or move towards it. And it's a pretty technical discussion um, I'm not going to go into the detail of why it works now, and probably divergence deserves a whole tutorial on its own. But in this case, all we need to know is that this is going to tend to force the smoke away from the center of this sphere. And to see this properly, I'm going to increase again the scale of this. Uh, because if you leave the scale at its default, it's sometimes a bit difficult to see. So let me just turn off the visualization of this and let our simulation simulate through. And what we should see, here we are, we, you can probably see there, after it's passing this sphere, that smoke is expanding a lot. It's being forced away from the sphere. And this is working in pretty much uh, the same way. So let me just look at our auto.network. And we've got, let me lay things out here. We've got this node here, source divergence, which is again a source volume. And it's adding, in this case, It's adding the divergence field from our source to the divergence field in our simulation. And note that by making this a negative field, let me just do that here. Let's make this minus 5. And then let's see what this should do is suck our fluid in. There we are. We can see it's, it's being sucked into a point because of that negative divergence. So again, that can be useful in terms of sculpting your simulations. So I thought I would round off this video by having a look at some of the parameters on the smoke solver. 
And it's worth saying straight up that the smoke solver is Houdini's basic solver for doing smoke simulations. For anything very sophisticated, you'll want to use the pyro solver instead, which has much more powerful tools for shaping the appearance of your smoke and your flames. But nevertheless, some of the basic concepts are the same for pyro and for smoke, so we might as well cover them here when we're looking at the smoke solver. And the basic parameters are here on the simulation tab. And for those of you familiar with Houdini 11, you'll notice there are fewer parameters. And one of the things in particular that's missing is the workflow involving verticals. Now, I won't go into that in detail now, but essentially the improved smoke solver and indeed pyro solver in Houdini 11, in Houdini 12 rather, means that you don't really need to use verticals, which are a way of adding swirling into your into your uh, smoke, uh, because the curl noise and the sourcing and the revised solver mean that you get much more impressive smoke simulations anyway. So enough of that, let's have a look at some of the differences. So I've got two identical solvers set up here, left and the right, with the same source in effect. So let's first of all look at the issue of buoyancy. We know what it does. Buoyancy is a force which acts on hot smoke, causing it to, by default, rise upwards. And the reason it's rising upwards is because this value is positive rather than negative, and because this axis is set to be the y-axis, the, the upward pointing axis. So, for example, I can increase this force, uh, and then we should see this one on the left rise more quickly than the one on the right. Now, note that buoyancy is proportional to temperature. So if I had scaled the temperature field of the source here on the left, uh, then it would in any case be rising more quickly than the one on the right, because the hotter it is, uh, the higher the buoyancy. So let's have a quick look at this. And we should be able to see uh, that. And I apologize, I've in fact left one of these parameters other than default, so let's put that back at the default. So they are now both the same apart from buoyancy. And we should see here that this smoke rises more quickly than the other. Let me revert that back to default. The viscosity is a control which looks at how thick your smoke is. And it does this by blurring out the velocity field a bit. So the smoke that's near a, slow piece, a slowly moving piece of smoke will be dragged back by it. So let's give this a sort of middling value here. And we should then see that this shoots up. This one is moving, but it's moving very, very slowly indeed because that viscosity is affecting the smoke. And when you've got a simulation that's got a lot of movement in it, uh, it's probably a bit easier to see the viscosity. And let's revert that back to its default. So let's look now at these controls which deal with temperature, which are cooling rate and temperature diffusion. And in order to look at them, it's a good idea to introduce some of the other fields other than density, which is what we've basically been visualizing here, which are important as part of our smoke simulation. So let me have a look at our smoke object in order to see these fields. And we can see here under the Guides tab, uh, we have quite a large list of fields. Let me enlarge this so that we can see it. Uh, let me take away the multi-field, which is a sort of special field. But the ones that are actually being used in our calculation, or may be used in our calculation, are these density, temperature, fuel, divergence, burn, heat, velocity, collision, source, and sink. Well, in fact, not all of these are going to be used in a standard smoke simulation, though they will be used in a pyro simulation. In particular, when you're not using 
the Pyro simulation, you won't tend to use fuel, burn, or heat. Those are to do with the, the calculation of a burning reaction, which is, which is not what we're using here. So density is obviously the thickness of your smoke. Temperature is how hot it is. Divergence is that field that I mentioned earlier, which determines whether smoke needs to be sucked into a particular voxel or forced out of it. Velocity is obviously the speed of the smoke. The collision uh, field records the objects which your smoke is going to collide with. Uh, and that's under the traditional way of simulating collisions. The source is obviously where your smoke is coming from. And again, that's the traditional way of looking at simulations. And then the sink is associated with the sink, which I uh, the, sink, the sink shelf tool, which I just demonstrated earlier. So these controls that we're looking at on the smoke solver are to do with temperature. So let's visualize the temperature. And I'm going to visualize it also on the right here. Turn off the multi-field visualization. And these are set up here we can control how they're visualized. These are set up by default using a black body visualization mode uh, with a range of 0 to 1. So these areas that are sort of fiery yellow have a temperature of 1. The redder areas have a lower temperature and obviously the transparent area here has a temperature of 0. And what happens at every frame is that temperature is being added by the source which we've we've seen, we've set up a temperature field, which by default has a value of 1. That temperature is being added at every frame, but also the smoke that's away from the source is getting cooler at every frame. And the rate at which it cools down is set by this cooling rate here. So if I were to, for example, give it a very, very high cooling rate, so this is really high, almost all of the temperature is going to disperse over the course of a second. And let's see the difference that this makes. So we can see that this one is rushing up more quickly, whereas this one, the heat is dissipating away and it's, it, it's not moving up so quickly. And the reason it's not moving up so quickly is, as I mentioned, that the buoyancy is related to the temperature. So as soon as the smoke cools down to a temperature of zero, it's no longer going to have any buoyancy lift applied to it. And the result of that, let me just pause this, will be when we visualize density, that our smoke is going to clog up and sort of collect here at the top of our container because it's no longer moving upwards. So that's the cooling rate. Let me return that to its default. And then the temperature diffusion controls, if you like, the blurring of the temperature field over time. So if we have a look now, this has got a very high temperature diffusion on the left. And we can see that what happens is that temperature field is being blurred much more widely as a result of, of this higher temperature diffusion. In fact, I can increase this right up. And this this will diffuse much more quickly. And you may ask, well, what's the point of that in terms of a smoke simulation? And indeed, it's not re very relevant when we're dealing with smoke. It, it does have the effect of slightly cooling our smoke because the, the temperature is diffusing away from the smoke. It's more important, really, when you've got uh, pyro simulations and you've got big differences in temperature between one part of the simulation and another or you're using the temperature of smoke or flames to ignite a fuel that's elsewhere in your simulation and in those cases the rate at which the temperature diffuses can be pretty important. Now the time scale parameter is important if you want to change the rate at which your simulation runs. 
So if I give myself a time scale of 0.5 here on this side of the simulation and then play it, uh, we can see that the left hand side is moving much more slowly than the right hand side. And that's not in this case because any of the properties of the simulation are different, they're all the same. The only difference is that time has been slowed down here on the left, and this is producing, therefore, this slower simulation. And that can be useful for a number of things. Uh, it's often quite easy to get the look of a simulation broadly white, right, but then you find that actually it's changing too quickly and that it doesn't look uh, real. And by reducing the time scale, you can give it that stately motion that uh, smoke sometimes has. So that's the use of the timescale parameter. The next tab here are to do with relationships. And these are to do with the old-fashioned way of working with sources, pumps, collisions and sinks. And those are covered in my earlier videos on smoke, but I'm not going to go into them here because they're not really to do with Houdini 12. Houdini 12 has this new workflow which we've seen whereby we create the source or the pump or the sink or the collision object in SOPS and then we use the the solver, the source, this, this solver node here, this source volume solver to actually affect the simulation using those uh, sorry, using those volumes. So this part of the smoke solver, the relationships uh, part, is really to do with the old-fashioned way of doing, sim uh, of doing smoke simulations, not the Houdini 12 way. They are, however, useful in circumstances where the source or the pump or the collisions and so on are with RBD objects that are being simulated elsewhere in your scene. And in those cases, it may be easier to use the old-fashioned route of setting up a relationship between the RBD object and your smoke. And that will allow you to use, for example, an RBD object, a moving RBD object, as a smoke source. The advanced tab is really not of much uh, interest unless you're doing very advanced adjustments to your simulation. Uh, the only thing I would say is that if you have a very complicated simulation you may want to increase the number of sub-steps to make it more accurate. You can use OpenCL, so you can use your graphics card to speed up the simulation, uh, but when you're using a, a relatively low size of simulation this probably isn't going to increase the speed that much and you also need a pretty powerful uh, graphics card to make it work. So you probably don't need to change these. If you really want to get into understanding how this solver works, uh, then you can have a look at the inside of it. And you can do that, it's off the bottom of this screen, uh, but there's an instruction here on the menu to allow editing of contents. If I select that, I can then dive in and we can see in all its glory the huge complexity of the smoke solver. And each of these individual nodes is documented, so if you have the time and the inclination, you can work through them using the documentation and work out exactly what each step of the smoke solver is doing. And here is the relevance of these different attachments on the top of our smoke solver, because they represent ways of adding in micro solvers, which is what these nodes here are, there are ways of adding in microsolvers at different points in your simulation. And if you middle click on these, you can see that this is the pre-solve. So this happens right at the beginning of our solve step. Then we've got velocity update. So if we've got something that's updating the velocity of our smoke, we would attach it here. Then we've got advection. This is the thing, this is the actual movement of the smoke. And then finally, we've got the post-solve. Uh, which includes sourcing new smoke, which happens here.
So that's pretty much uh, a complete rundown of the smoke solver in Houdini 12. I hope it's been useful.